Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Animaction. Welcome to the second part of the 1997 entry in my Animated 90s series. There's some real awesomeness to get to in this video, so I won't delay long. I'll just throw out a quick reminder to come check out the Discord server and become part of a really excellent community over there, and spare you from any of my other logistics in this episode. Without further ado, let's pick up where we left off, now that we finished the kid stuff. The year didn't just bring shows for the little kitties, though, as we got a very healthy dose of adult-targeted animation as well from a variety of different networks. Kicking things off here, we'll take a look at Fox, which gave us one of the biggest hits of the year and longest-lasting animated series of all time with King of the Hill. I know I usually save the best in each category for last, but this category for this particular year is way too stacked to do that with. Anyway, King of the Hill came from creator Mike Judge, who we spoke about a few years ago with his first massive hit, Beavis and Butthead. Unlike that show, this one was based much more firmly around mostly normal people in the mostly real world, following the daily life of Hank Hill, purveyor of propane and propane accessories, his family, and his group of drinking buddies. Seeing as the show has a current record of 259 episodes over 13 seasons, with a revival on the way to Hulu sometime in the near future, I don't imagine there's much more I need to say about this one. One piece of trivia that I found interesting is that one of the composers for the series' music, Greg Edmondson, was the man responsible for the soundtrack to Firefly, which is actually one of my favorite TV soundtracks. Also, as I mentioned a little earlier, that dumbing down phenomenon that I described in I Am Weasel is pretty reminiscent of my personal favorite Mike Judge property, Idiocracy. And while I'm here, happy birthday to my fellow army vet, Jeff Odenso7187. Uh, unfortunately, I don't do impressions. That boy ain't right. Moving on, we'll shift over to MTV, and the first of two series they released for adults this year. Oddly enough, having just mentioned Beavis and Butthead, the first of these stars a character who spun off from that one. Daria is a series that follows the trials and tribulations of the very intelligent, very cynical high school student Daria Morgendorfer, as she and her best friend Jane deal with life in a Texas high school. See, I told you this year was stacked, and we've still got a lot of awesome to go. This one, though, is one of my favorites in this category, as I relate pretty well with Daria's cynicism and sarcasm, not to mention her frustration at dealing with most of the people around her. And it's far superior to the show that came before. Not King of the Hill, uh, Beavis and Butthead. It ran for 65 episodes over five seasons. The other one that MTV gave us was the torchbearer for the network's earlier show Liquid Television, called Cartoon Sushi. This show, like Liquid TV before it, served as a showcase for alternative animation over its short 15 episode run, and was the launch point for the show Celebrity Deathmatch, as well as an animated adaptation of the video game Abe's Odyssey. Most importantly for horror fans though, of which I count myself one, it had a segment called Season's Greetings, from creator Michael Doherty, which he would eventually expand into the awesome circular anthology film Trick or Treat. Our next series takes us to Comedy Central for the first time in this series of videos, with a new show that puts all of the others on this list to shame in terms of longevity, cultural impact, and widespread recognition. It is, of course, Matt Stone and Trey Parker's paper cutout phenomenon, South Park. You know how I mentioned King of the Hill was a long-running show just a minute ago? Well, South Park puts that to shame, with 325 episodes over 26 seasons. Currently, that is, as the series is still airing new weekly episodes to this day. Really though, there's not much to say in this short format, as a huge chunk of the world's population has likely at least heard of this show. It's a true pop culture pillar at this point that can rival any other property out there. There's so many awesome things about the series that I'll just mention a couple of them, like it having the fastest turnaround time for any animated series in history, with the ability to fit world events into an episode the same week they occur, or having a theme song by the always amazing band Primus. Oh, and it also had two of the best licensed video games ever released, with the RPGs The Stick of Truth and The Fractured But Whole. I'm not going to say it the way they want me to, sorry. We'll end this category with a look at HBO, which aired a series from animation renegade Ralph Bakshi this year called Spicy City. This was a six-episode cyberpunk anthology set in a future noir city, with episodes presenting storylines like finding love in a virtual world, a detective searching for a missing girl but finding her clone, or being born with the wrong DNA, all hosted by the sultry nightclub singer Raven. It's an interesting series, especially for fans of Bakshi, even though he didn't have a ton of direct involvement. The animation is pretty stunning, and the stories are pleasantly weird, plus Raven is voiced by Michelle Phillips, from iconic 60s band The Mamas and the Papas. Last in this category, but certainly not least, is one of the best animated comic book adaptations ever put to film, with Todd McFarlane's Spawn. 
This series came to HBO for 18 episodes this year and stretched those across three seasons, each of which can be considered kind of a standalone movie. It was an amazingly accurate retelling of the story from the Spawn comics, published by Image, easily beating all of the other adaptations that came before it, with the exception of maybe The Max. The series was ridiculously dark, mature, and well-produced, with amazing art and a voice cast led by the equally amazing Keith David. I was never the biggest fan of the Spawn comics when they came out, but I am a fan of this show. If you like dark storytelling in your animation, I highly recommend checking this one out. And that's what I meant about a stacked category, with two-thirds of the series in it probably deserving entire episodes of their own. So this is a category that I'm just going to include in every year going forward, as there will be more and more series that I think aired in the US, or incorporate some weird method of blending animation with other formats, or some other excuse that I can make that precludes them from any other category on the list. Let's begin with a couple of shows that I'm fairly confident aired here, but originated somewhere else, and I'm not able to find solid records for. The first of these is a series of shorts from the UK called Microscopic Milton, which I think made it to the Disney Channel this year. It's a collection of 26 five-minute episodes about a tiny humanoid that lives in a clock in a lady's house and his adventures after making friends with her dog. The other one I'm not completely sure about is called Princess Sissy and comes from the Paris branch of Saban International. As best my research can tell, I think this one may have gotten some airtime on Fox Kids or in its Jetix programming block sometime this year. It's a fictionalized story about the real-life Empress of Austria and Queen of Hungary, Elizabeth Amelie Eugenie, and follows a young version of the monarch as she falls in love and tries to arrange a marriage in the face of court intrigue and deception. And finally here we have a live-action series out of Canada that I'm almost positive did air here in the U.S. on various Fox affiliates called Student Bodies. No, not that one. This one was more in the vein of Saved by the Bell, mostly following a group of normal high schoolers, but occasionally going into the imagined, animated world of teenage cartoonist Cody. These parts of the show are why I'm including it here at all, as they were a significant aspect of the series and deserving of a mention. It ran for 65 episodes across three seasons in syndication. And finally we reach my favorite category, where I get a chance to talk about all of the action series that this year brought or the rest of them, I guess, as we've covered a few that could really fit here pretty nicely. Let's begin with the return of a badly missed series from last year with the new Batman Adventures. This one picked up the reins of Batman the Animated Series and served as an official third season of that show, but revamped it with some of the newer animation styles being used in Superman the Animated Series to create more continuity across the universe. Running for 24 episodes as part of Kids WB, the show is set in what would appear to be a timeline taking place several years after the original animated series, with an expanded roster of Bat Family characters like the Tim Drake Robin, who they actually presented as kind of an amalgamation of both Tim Drake and Jason Todd, Nightwing, and Batgirl, and focus more on the other inhabitants of Gotham than the Dark Knight himself. There were also some modifications, like changes to Batman's equipment and the use of Batgirl as a partner character more often than Robin. I love big rosters and superhero shows though, so this new approach to the series worked just fine for me. Next up is the latest entry in the anthropomorphic hero team and the second Extreme series to come out this year, with Extreme Dinosaurs. This one has an intergalactic criminal appearing on Earth 65 million years ago and turning four normal dinosaurs and several velociraptors into superpowered soldiers. Unfortunately, the leader of the raptors, called Bad Rap, accidentally uses one of the aliens' weapons to cause the extinction of all of the other dinos and forces them to flee to modern day, where our heroes rebel and stand against the criminal and the raptors as they try to terraform the Earth by speeding up global warming. It ran for a single 52-episode season syndicated as part of the Bobot Kids Network. Moving on, we have the show Vampires, which I'd never heard of before researching this series, but which I'm told is somewhat controversial. Not because of the series itself, which was like the Hammer Films version of Turbo Teen, and focused on four kids who were turned into non-transformers by a meteor to protect Earth from the evil anthropomorphic vampires, and their leader Dracula, as the horrendously named Motor Vaders. With a premise like that, I can't imagine why it only got 13 syndicated episodes. But back to the controversy, that's apparently about a debate whether or not the series featured actor Gary Oldman, in the role of hippie mentor Van Heelsing. The character only appears in the credits as being played by himself, and there's a persistent rumor that it really is the prolific actor. I did as much research as I could on the debate though, and I don't really buy it. Primarily I don't because in 1998, Oldman was already a well-established actor who was paid $5 million for his role in Lost in Space. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that that was more than the entire budget for the whole Vampire series. 
There's no way they could have afforded him. I did see, however, an interesting suggestion that the character was played by The Who's John Entwistle, who is credited by name for work he did on the series' soundtrack, and was actually proud enough of that work for him and his band to release an album of the music from it. I personally find that to be far more likely, but I don't have any more evidence than anyone else out there, so believe what you will. Next up here in action is one of my personal favorites of the year, and it's another team of transforming characters with superpowers, this time using a group of ancient Egyptians in the form of mummies alive. The series tells the story of a 12-year-old boy who possesses the soul of a fictionalized King Ramses named Rapses XII. The mummies of the show's title are a quartet of the prince's former bodyguards, brought back to life by the reappearance of his spirit and that of the evil sorcerer who killed him. The mummies use the mystic power of Ra to become armor-clad representations of various important animals in Egyptian mythology, with a variety of powers and gear which they use to protect the young Presley from the wicked scarab. It was a really cool show, and I thought it had some great animation, but it only lasted a single 42-episode season in syndication. And finally, we'll close out both this category and the year overall with the closest thing the year gave us to a tokusatsu, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Next Mutation. As the term tokusatsu would lead you to believe, this was a super pseudomation series starring our four favorite turtles with appearances similar to those they had in the first three movies, and with the addition of a new partner in the form of a previously unknown fifth turtle who had been in the same bowl and exposed to the same mutagen, but had been swept off and lost to Chinatown. If this were in canon, then not going to look for a missing child would knock Splinter down a bit on my list of best ads. Anyway, this fifth turtle is the female Venus de Milo, who rejoins the main four in their battles against first Shredder and the Foot Clan, and later Dragon Lord and his evil minions called the Rank. They even crossed over with another popular tokusatsu series of the time by appearing in Power Rangers Space. Unfortunately, the show wasn't very well received, especially by the standards set by the original animated series, and it only got a single 26 episode season on Fox Kids. Worse yet, Venus de Milo, who was actually really interesting and added a new dynamic to the core four, is a creation that original Turtles co-creator Peter Laird hates with a passion in his band from all of the main canon, so we'll never see her in another official Turtle series he's involved with. Oh, one other item of note for the series is that Michelangelo doesn't have his normal nunchucks either, but instead sports a pair of nightstick-like tanfa, probably because nunchucks are not only actually really dangerous, but also illegal in most states. Now it's time for that part of the video where I tell you all where and how to watch these series as of September 2023. There's a few that you can't, but it's a fairly light list. It includes Extreme Ghostbusters, which have an out-of-print DVD and a Region 2 release if you want to look for it, Nightmare Ned, Princess Sissy, which also has an out-of-print DVD, Cartoon Sushi, Channel Umpty 3, The Ink and Paint Club, which is classic Disney shorts you can watch elsewhere, The New Adventures of Zorro, also out-of-print, Walter Mellon, I Am Weasel, which surprised me quite a bit, Men in Black the Series, which has an out-of-print Season 1 DVD, but the rest was never released on DVD, O Canada, and Science Court. There are a decent number of these that you can find on YouTube, though, so take a look there. A couple of series can be found on various free streaming services, though, like The Adventures of Sam and Max, Freelance Police, The Legend of Calamity Jane, and Extreme Dinosaurs on Tubi, with Extreme Dinosaurs multiple other places as well, like Peacock, Prime, and Pluto. You can also find Power Rangers Turbo and Daria both on Pluto as well. We have our first Sling TV appearance of the series with Kipper, and King of the Hill is on Hulu. Disney Plus and HBO Max come in strongest this year though, with 101 Dalmatians the series, Pepper Ann, and Recess all on Disney Plus, and Todd McFarlane's Spawn, South Park, The New Batman Adventures, and Spicy City on HBO Max. Several series this year can be watched on other various subscriptions or digitally purchased from a few places as well, like Mummies Alive, Tenchi Universe, The Wacky World of Tex Avery, Microscopic Milton, Gadget Boy's Adventures in History, The Angry Beavers, Cow and Chicken, Johnny Bravo, and TMNT The Next Mutation. And finally, of course, there are several that can be at least partially purchased on DVD, including Vampires, Power Rangers Turbo, Tenchi Universe, The Wacky World of Tex Avery, though that one costs an arm and or leg, Microscopic Milton, Kipper, Gadget Boy's Adventures in History, TMNT The Next Mutation, The Legend of Calamity Jane, The Angry Beavers, Daria, King of the Hill, The Mr. Men Show, The New Batman Adventures, Recess, well, at least the movie, South Park, and Todd McFarlane's Spawn. As is the norm, you'll find links to all of those in the description. And that's all I've got for 1997. 
It was a pretty full year, and easily the best in the decade so far in the area of adult animation. There are plenty of other series from the year that I'll happily watch, but with South Park and King of the Hill on the list, it's hard for anything else to compare. Make sure to check out the channel memberships, as I'll be adding another perk or two over the next several days, and because I haven't mentioned them in a while, take a look at my 80s designs and my writing, of which there are samples available on my website. Links in the description. Regardless of any of that, though, I appreciate y'all being here. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned and stay tuned, as in cartoons. Later.